Hello and Cthulhu Fatagn to all my friends out there in internet land. I'm Dakian and I'm here to take a first look at a new miniatures game that just arrived. Well, no, it actually arrived last week, but I uh, needed some time to read through the rulebook. This is called Strange Aeons, and it's the second edition, uh, so it's not technically new. This book is new. And the miniatures, I believe, are all brand new. Uh, so let's take a first look at the, the, this. Um, I pledged for the rulebook and two packs of minis. Um, this is the base set, the core set, which contains a bunch of um, threshold agents who are the good guys, some cultists who are bad guys, they belong to the lurker faction and some objective markers, these loot crates. Um, this was... Th these were the bonus minis produced just for the Kickstarter, which is one bad guy, one good guy, and some pumpkins. And I also got an ex booster set, so to speak, with more agents. Um, if we pour these out, and have a look at them. They are a... What are they made from? They're sort of in between. They, they're, they're, they're kind of resin, I think. They're not quite injection molded plastic, but they're good resin. They are a... Well, in, in this guy you can see a pretty clear mold line, which is not terrific. But it's it's like it's limited to one, well, well one mold line running down the side of each mini at least. Um, let's see how this guy looks. He's kind of he's no no he's got a bad mold line there as well. That is unfortunate. But seeing as it's on, it's on the sides of trousers, legs, and sleeves. And those are areas that don't have much detail, and if you you can scrape down these mold lines without any loss of anything major. Most people will be looking at them from this angle or, or the back anyway, not from the side. Um, here's a dual gun wielding guy. And yes, the requisite mold line is there on him as well. And then we have the only female investigator in a flapper skirt and a, with a shotgun, which is and she has the same mold line as everybody else. I'm I'm starting to sense a theme here. Here we have a sort of foremost Bob of evil. Oh, and he there's a separate tentacle that slots in here somehow. You have to glue that in place, I suppose. Uh, not much in the mole, way the mole lines on this guy. Um, and on the tentacle, I believe it's hidden in the, um, the separation between the, the suckers and the scales. And here we have a fish man. It's labeled, and this one is better cast, actually. It's it's cleaner. How are the cultists doing? Yes, slight mold line, but not as bad as on the good guys. And... Priest with Egyptian headdress. Oh no, he has a mold line. I... <laughs> Yeah, they, they all have mold lines down the side, more or less. It's just a question of degree. Uh, these chests are better. And the crates... I mean, because these are so heavily textured, you probably wouldn't notice if there was a mold line anyway. And we have a, a midget cultist. It's unfortunate, but, but I think... I think I can clean these up without ruining them. They're not in any. Um, they're, they're not. 
the mole lines are at least not on. Well, here it covers his hair a little bit. Oh, that's too bad. Really sorry about that, but oh well. Uh, I can't win them all. How is how do this set there? Same old lines for the exorcist, and here we have the madman, and yes, same story there. But these, I don't expect them to have much. There's a pumpkin with something on there, and there's a, I think it's a gravestone for Pikmin. You know, of course. And here we have the extra. Threshold Agents, and here we have dapper looking guy. It's mo For some reason, most of them have mole lines down the left side that are more pronounced than the ones on their right sides. And here we have the Bagman. Again, oh, I spoke too soon. He has a really bad mole line down his right side. And we have little children for some reason. Why? 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 Why are we endangering the children in a combat zone with evil cultists? I don't know. Here is another dude with a pistol and a knife. Somebody with a experimental ray gun and goggles. A a female man in black. Uh, looks like Scully or something. Much more modern dress than than the, the other 1920s female. So there's a lack dearth of representation for women here. That's one issue, and and the mole lines I don't like. But I like the sculpts of these. They are very nice looking miniatures. I like the. Um, 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 I like the look of them. I like the size of them. I, I brought out a... This is a guy I painted up for Call of Cthulhu. This is a Reaper miniature. It's like a 32 millimeter scale. And if you put this guy next to him, you can see he's the same size. These are also 32. You see, he, he has to be aligned so that his foot... This guy's slightly bigger. Hang on, let me get a tape. I misspoke before. Uh, this Reaper miniature, Reaper, I think, Chronoscope or Savage Worlds, is actually 28 millimeters if you measure from the soles of his feet to his eye level, which is how you're supposed to measure miniatures. This guy, who is the, a good example because he's standing perfectly straight, is 30. So they are slightly bigger. See? 30 to the eyes. So I, I, I was of two minds about the miniatures, as, as I mentioned. It, I skipped ahead a little bit there because I started uh, rambling on about how I wanted to base them, and that's not really relevant for this first look. That's something I can bring up again when I start painting them. Um, so the rule book, uh, as I said, the miniatures, I like them. They're, they're going to be a bit of work to clean up, I suspect. But here's the rule book, and it's it's very nice. It's spiral bound. It has, for some reason, an extra plastic dust cover or something. But the covers are very thick, glossy cardstock, and the pages are pretty good quality paper as well. the um, The contents are very complete. Uh, there's only about 20 or so, so pages of rules. The the uh, basic rules are about 12 pages, and then there's another eight pages of advanced rules. But then you have rules for setup and and campaigns, and so these 20 the 20 rules I mentioned, 20 pages of rules I mentioned are for how to actually play a game. Uh, now, um, the like I said, the campaign and advancement rules uh, appear later, and here I, I I have to add that there's sort of an odd thing going on here where 
the placement of certain rules is not very logical. Uh, the rules for equipment, you, you 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 get the rules for for setting up your faction here, and it talks about buying equipment, but equipment appears later after after all the monsters, after all the stats uh, like w what would be the army lists in another game I, you know, it really doesn't make a great amount of sense to me and, and what you do and the rules for advancement appear after scenarios so, well, there, there, there's a bit of flipping back and forth to find things um, that's, but that's actually one of my few criticisms because the rules themselves are fine they are a bit different from many other games you would be forgiven for thinking they were similar to other games because if you look at a profile line you, you have stats that seem self-evident movement, which is in inches dex, which is the number or how you need to roll to hit with a uh, ranged weapon, constitution, which is a kind of uh, threshold, toughness threshold, attacks, which is the number of dice you roll in melee, wounds, how many wounds you have, uh, res is it resist resolve is, is uh, your morale, essentially, and you have some skill. Oops. Um, but the way it works in play is slightly different from other games. So the first mechanic, which is uh, interesting and, and uh, unique in my experience, though my experience is admittedly limited, it's probably been done before, I just haven't seen it, is how activations are made. Uh, what, what every other game calls activations are here called nominations. That's how you, you, know, you nominate a model to act when it's your turn. And you play alternating turns, they go back and forth between the two sides. And here's the interesting thing. On your turn, you will choose one model to nominate. One. <laughs> Just one. And that's it. And once that model has done its nomination, it's over to the other guy. Uh, okay. And it's not a matter of alternating activations. It's not like in Malifaux where you just yeah, switch back and forth, activating, and, and then the turn is done. No, the turn is one nomination. However, if you nominate a model that has the command ability, it can nominate two others. And if it has, I think it's called improved command, it can nominate, I think, three others. So, you also at least at the beginning stages of a campaign, it is quite possible that you only three have three models on a side. The threshold player will very likely start with only three models. So if one of those has command, well, then you do get to go with all of them in every turn. Uh, this leads to two uh, things. Number one, the command ability is crucial. If you have a lot of models on your side but nobody has command you're kind of screwed because there's no way to to leverage uh, your your uh, your numbers and second even if you have command numerical advantage uh, does not allow you to steamroller the opponent because it doesn't let you you know do something with all of those models what it does is it gives you uh, resilience. I mean, if you have more models than the other guy, you, you don't get to do more in a turn, but once your s guys start dying, you have reserves. So, you will you might outlast your opponent that way. And that's an interesting uh, dynamic. Again, in my experience, I haven't seen it before. Uh, it's probably been done in some game that I haven't read, but uh, such is the way of things. Um, when it comes to what you actually do, most of it is attacking, of course, and attacks are handled by rolling a bunch of dice, six-sided dice, always. 
And sometimes you're rolling a fistful of dice, but the thing is, you only count the highest one. You only count your best roll. So the numbers never get beyond six plus whatever bonus you might have. And well, there's and there's some optional rules for for critical rolls and fumbles and so forth. But but the basic idea is your best roll counts. And it's the same thing, and, and this is slightly confusing when it comes to hitting somebody. I'm used. To, it says each model has a number of wounds, and I'm used to thinking that okay, once those wounds are gone, it's dead. Well, that's not quite how it works here. What happens is that when you roll for damage, um, and you you do reduce wounds. What happens when you get to zero or below is that you have to roll on a certain table. And um, let's see, where is it? Yeah, here it is. The injury table. You roll 2d6. And any extra damage uh, above what, what you needed to get to zero wounds is a bonus, is added on to the roll. And anything between 2 and a 6, you're still on the table. Um, you're just knocked down, either face up or face down, and those are different states that uh, of, of knockdown that you can recover from. If you are only knocked down and you manage to get up again, then you act as if you had one wound left going forward. It's only on a seven or better on the injury table that you actually take the model off the table. Um, so, that adds an extra step to the proceedings, and you might notice that there is, there is relatively um, a lot of math in this game. You need to do a lot of adding and subtracting at the table. I think this is balanced out by the fact that the model count is so low. I mean, in the example game at the end of the book, the, the threshold player has three models and the lurker player has four. And that's it. So I, I think games will go by pretty quickly anyway. Uh, of course, being a Cthulhu game, there has to be rules for psychology that is for fear and horror and insanity. You can roll on an insanity table and you can get various phobias. And as I said, here are the advanced rules with critical hits and misses and jumping and dealing with terrain in more advanced ways. Fighting with two weapons, uh, black marks, is an interesting idea where where the good guys, the threshold players, can uh, can get advantages by doing bad deeds, but they get uh, corrupted. They get their souls are eroded by this, and they get black marks against them, and they have to roll on a corruption table to see what happens to them. There's also psychic powers, which are interesting. It's it's it, you don't buy psychic powers. It's random. You roll whenever you recruit a new model for the threshold. You roll two d six. If you get a two or twelve, they've tested positive for psychic powers, and you roll randomly on another table to see what they get. Um, it's there is one rule here which is unclear to me. I don't know how to interpret it quite. And it's the one, one about activating psychic, psychic powers. Now, if you're psychic, you start the game not having those powers active. And you have to... Um, you've got essentially a 1 in 5 chance whenever you try to activate them, guessing correctly. The opponent secretly chose, chooses one of the Zener cards, and you have to guess which one. If you guess, boom. It says... The model is free to use their psychic powers from this point onward in the game. What's unclear to me is if it's by game they just mean that specific scenario and you have to reactivate them again next time you play, or in the game means, you know, the game as a whole, as, as in the rest of the campaign. Um, I would hope it means the later because it the psychic powers really don't seem worth it otherwise if you have to keep every time you play a scenario which is only 
like half a dozen turns usually and you have to waste turns trying to activate those these powers that you know I uh, I don't know but it, it just depends on how efficient they are in play you know I'd have to test that out to see When it comes to actually playing the game, you have to choose a faction. As I said, there are two factions, the Threshold and the Lurkers. Threshold is like is a sort of secret government agency, kind of Delta Green-like. Um, and the Lurkers are, you know, all the monsters, all the bad guys. And the interesting thing here is that they play by different rules. The Threshold, they play as as like a warband in a in a campaign game in some other miniature skirmish game that is you you buy your models with points and then you they get can get damaged or upgraded as the campaign goes on they can get more equipment they can get more skills you can recruit new models all the usual stuff the lurker player does none of that instead the lurker player in every scenario builds a list from scratch of equal point value to what the threshold player is bringing. And the the, the lurker player never has to worry about uh, damage. their stuff getting... Uh, blah, blah. They never have to worry about their models getting killed because they always have new monsters, you know, to throw into the fray. And... Huh. That's kind of interesting. Now, now they say here in, in the selecting factions... A part of the rules that many places players will choose to alternate roles but there's no requirement to do so some players only wish to play as lurkers so so the the idea is that you can have a campaign with a bunch of players and each player has has a threshold uh, crew so to speak um, but whenever they play a game they don't play against directly against each other they don't play threshold versus threshold but instead one of the other players uh, takes on the role of lurker, so so essentially it's not it's not an antagonistic campaign. It's more like uh, well, it's like like they alternate being the GM, but but again the, there is the option of just playing lurker all the time, if you're not interested in in building a what what's it called? I don't forget. It's not a crew. That's the Malifaux. Uh, the lists they call it, or personnel. Um, yeah. So that's an interesting structure that I haven't seen before. Now, as I mentioned, most of the book is lists of various agents, types of agents you can recruit. Here are these various good guys and a little bit gear promotions blah, blah. and then the lurk the lurkers the majority of the book is actually stats for all the different kinds of monsters that the lurkers can play and they're subdivided into chapters according to their origin like we have the aliens and the beasts the demons and so on and so on and ghosts and of course evil humans cultists and yeah and the final interesting thing i want to bring up about this game is the scenarios it has comparatively a ton of scenarios. I mean, many, 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 most skirmish games I've seen lately, they start with, generally with six, because then you can randomize them with a d6. And there are only six scenarios. In, in this game, you have the basic scenario list, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then you have an advanced scenario table, another one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it, when you get really advanced, for some reason, that table is much later in the book. Again, strange sorting. Uh, you get quest scenarios. But, of course, the reason that this is separate is probably because you don't roll them. The quest scenarios 
are based on drops you find in other scenarios. You have to find what are called map pieces that allow you to choose a quest scenario. But there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 quest scenarios. So there is a metric ton of different scenarios you can play, which is really interesting. And, well, at the end you have some templates you can copy and cut out if you like. A log sheet for your uh, models you can copy. A, and some a reference table, which the back cover is, is well laminated. So that's useful for reference. So what's my impression of this game? It seems really fun and interesting. I, I'm... I'm jazzed to to kind of give this a go and because of the way it's set up you know I, I could try to get some of my uh, non-miniatures playing friends involved you know if I paint up all the minis and they get to build threshold lists and I play the lurker against them as a kind of game master yeah maybe I could get them interested in this and of course, I'm going to try to see if some of my miniature playing friends will be interested as well. Anyway, that is all the impressions I have at the moment of Strange Aeons. Uh, if you thought it was interesting, or if you have more questions about how it works, please comment, like the video, and so forth. But that's going to be all for now. So until next video, I'm Dr. Yon, and I'm signing off.